Hello and welcome to the CLB Forge podcast. This is the show to help equip you and your church for mission, ministry, and multiplying disciples. I'm Ryan Nilsson. And I'm Mike Natal. We are your hosts. Welcome to episode three. Have you ever struggled with how to help your church make healthy changes? Today's episode is all about leading change. Right now, we find ourselves in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. It's mid-June, and many churches are slowly beginning to reopen for on-site worship services. In times like this, there's a lot of difficult decisions being made and complicated changes being worked on. Maybe you're feeling overwhelmed and could use some tools to help you navigate through some of these difficult and tough situations. In this episode, we hope to equip you and your church to work through change in a healthy manner. So today, um, Ryan uh, is going to really lead the charge uh, through these key points of healthy change. And we're going to go through seven steps. And so, um, Ryan, I know in the past you have um, given and done classes through, um, this type of healthy change. And so I'm happy to have your opinion on this. And I know that this is something that you studied long and hard for. You got your, your doctorate in, uh, church health. And so I know that, uh, what you have shared is coming from a lot of study and research that you have done. So I'm really encouraged, uh, to hear what you have to say to us this morning or maybe not this morning, maybe you're listening to it at night, maybe you're listening to it in the afternoon, maybe it is past two o'clock and you really should be in bed. Uh, But regardless, Ryan, I'm I'm happy that you're willing to share some of your knowledge with us um, all about change. So why don't you kind of take it from here and see, kind of like walk us through what you had in mind for today. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Thanks so much. Yeah, we, this topic, uh, we just decided to, we knew this is something we wanted to get to eventually. But we thought during, especially during this time, during the coronavirus pandemic, as like churches are, they're, they're just settling into getting used to working off digital platforms. And now it's for a lot of churches, it's time to reopen or to start planning for it. So there's another set of changes and the reopening in and of itself will have a number of changes in it as well. And so there's just um, all kinds of um, kind of traps along the way or pitfalls, potential pitfalls that we can avoid if we know if we know what to look out for and how to do this. So this is not a comprehensive list and uh, maybe not even necessarily sequential, kind of, but we've got seven ways today to to lead change well, to lead it in a healthy manner. So yeah, this is something that is a key issue in church health, um, but also in leadership in general. Like, Like leadership, one of the key things about leadership is influencing change in others and As Christian leaders, we want to influence positive, healthy changes for the sake of the gospel and God's kingdom. And uh, you, and yet, change is something we all like to avoid. Um, Even even uh, positive change comes with a sense of loss, and so it can be really, really difficult. And when you study unhealthy churches, churches that are struggling, one of the common factors you see is a resistance to change, and that only gets the church in more trouble. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, but uh, that, that's why we felt like we, we, we need to address this now. So, so just like a, a few comments, a few other comments about change before we get into this list. Um, this is a, an important thing to do, an important thing to wrestle with, because if you don't, if your church doesn't change, it will eventually die. Um, and sometimes there's like a, a great season of success for the church. There's certain programs and ministries and leaders, and they're all happening at the same time, relationships. And the church is booming and growing and it's vibrant. And then someone says, let's always do it just this way. And that's when plateau and decline come for a church. That's when churches become less uh, open to change. They become more nervous about it. They focus more on, on uh, what's scary about, about change, the, the potential loss and anxiety that can come with it. And it only accelerates the, the troubles and demise for a church. And we absolutely can experience that uh, in this time, especially because we got to make a lot of decisions right in this moment as we reopen churches, decisions that not necessarily everyone's going to be in agreement about. And so it's very important to handle those very, very carefully. Um, 
Yeah. So if you don't change the right way, it can blow up your church. If you change the wrong things, you can stray from God's mission for your church. So this could almost be like an eighth point. I didn't make it this, but it's really important for us to not confuse uh, form and function. So the function of the church, those are like the purposes of the church. Um, those are the things that never change, right? So um, uh, we, we are to make disciples, we are to worship our God, we're to proclaim the gospel, right? Those are some of the essential things that we must always be about. Uh, we must always be making disciples. Uh, the, the function or the purpose never changes, but the form must. And that means the form is the way we do it the style of our worship or our approach to disciple making, the way we reach out to our community, the way we do evangelism and mission and uh, all of those things, the way we lead, even lead and structure our churches often has to go through some kind of change. And yet it's very easy. Sometimes people would rather, they would rather alter the purpose, God's uh, unchanging purposes. They would rather alter those than the form or the way it's done. And, and sometimes we confuse the two. Like, so people will think that our style of worship, that can never change because um, if we change our style of worship, that's a, we're, we're messing with those purposes of the church, which is not true, but we, we can kind of put things that must change into a category of things that, that never can change. We must always have this type of program. We must always have this, this ministry, the, this choir this organ music or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, and and we, we accidentally put them in a list of non-negotiables that was never intended for the church. So there's all kinds of challenges that uh, we end up dealing with when we're talking about leading changes. So um, change is about being able to take in new information and make adjustments to our ministry accordingly. And so Sometimes when a church gets in an unhealthy place, it becomes unwilling to accept new information and therefore it does not change. And that can really like suck the life out of the church. It could turn the church from a living being into a, into a skeleton it can ossify the church. So we have to keep in taking in new ideas, new information all the time. We have to make decisions and changes and changes mean loss and rejection. And that naturally leads to tension, conflict, and disagreement. And so in a healthy church, conflict will occur because you're making, you're making healthy changes. So that's just a natural part of it. So yeah, that's so important to, um, that's really important to point out, Ryan, like, yeah. like to make sure that when people see um, that there is going to be conflict and conflict within a church is okay. Because a lot of times people think like, well, as Christians, we shouldn't have conflict. Everything should just be, oh, everything's perfect. We're all happy. Things are going really well. Don't try to change things. It's going well. Just go about it. As opposed to a lot of good can come out of some tension, especially if we keep focused on the important things, which is the gospel, you know, like um, there was, there was a really big difference. So when I served a church in Minnesota and when I serve a church uh, out here in Rhode Island, there's, there's a really big difference in the way that people go about doing business. Business continued to happen in terms of like elder board meetings and stuff like that. Uh -huh. But the way that they functioned were different. And sometimes out here on the East coast, they got, they got heated to points where sometimes you would wonder, wow, are these people really like mad at each other? Like with the way that it's going on. But then after yeah. the meeting was over, yeah. you noticed and you knew that all of them had the church's best interest at hand and that all of this, all of these situations and their concerns that they were raising were out of uh, love and care for each other and love and care for what God has planned for the church as well, which is really important. So yeah. I, I can't reiterate that enough. Just saying like conflict is okay. As long as it's unhealthy, you know, there there's, there's a, a couple different ways of doing conflict. Conflict that doesn't have resolution can be incredibly dangerous. Yeah. A conflict that is brought in order to kind of stoke uh, change is very beneficial as long as people are all on the same page in terms of making sure that God is the one who is elevated in that change and conflict in your church. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I use change. I use conflict in a very broad sense in this case. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not talking about like people going at each other, trying to assassinate each other's character or split a yeah. church or that's when it gets bad and it's escalated and it's gotten out of control. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean it in the sense of it, it conflict can happen when it simply when you're not in agreement about a decision that needs to be made. That's right. conflict. And it's healthy to have a, an elder board or a governing board where you're not all in agreement and you know it, you, you share it with each other. It, it actually demonstrates a level of trust because mm. um, chances are on big decisions, you're not going to all be in agreement, but not everybody might be willing to express it. So true. Uh, when people are willing to express different opinions and then work through them, mm-hmm. that, that's actually, that, that shows that there's a healthy amount of trust I trust you enough that I can be vulnerable to d- enough to disagree with you and we can work through things from there. Totally. So, yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. So anyway, we, I think down the road we'll do, we'll do stuff on conflict and reconciliation. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll get into those things with other people as well. Um, yeah. But around change, there is disagreement. And so sometimes we just want to avoid change because then we don't have to deal with disagreement. Right. Well, there's going to be other types of disagreement and conflict that arise as a result of that. Uh, and so I we, think that if you, I think that if you deal with that type of conflict too, yeah, it yeah. prepares you to have better communication so that either stuff uh, doesn't arise where there's those large conflicts because you've done little ones, you've done mm-hmm. kind of like damage yeah. control moving forward, yeah. as opposed to allowing them to just build up and build up and build up. You know, I, I uh, through like pre-marriage counseling and whatnot, I oftentimes mm-hmm. tell people that one of one of the most important things in your relationship is communication. Cause they said a lack of communication. If you can picture an illustration being like a snowball and Ryan, you as like a hiker would love this. But if you picture a conflict as a snowball that starts up at the top of the mountain and you start to roll it downhill. Now, if you dealt with that conflict when it was a snowball, yeah. it's much more manageable as opposed to the more you let it build up and the more things that, you know, take on to itself, the larger that snowball gets and it's rolling downhill. So it's not only picking up speed, but it's also growing in size. And so eventually that snowball is going to get so large that you might not be able to completely handle it. And it's just going to come crashing down and who knows the devastation that it could cause. But if you dealt with it when it was a snowball, as opposed to, I mean, essentially like an avalanche, yeah. then yeah. you'd be, you'd be much better uh, prepared for it. So I yeah. always encourage people, you know, deal with the snowballs as a, so yeah. that they don't turn into, you know, these yeah. large avalanches yeah. that are almost impossible yeah. to deal with on your own. Yeah. Well, and we'll get into some things you can do to, we'll be talking about how you avoid that from becoming a massive conflict. Yeah. You know, deal with them when they're simple and small because people yeah. escalate conflict when they don't feel they've been heard. Mm-hmm. or understood it, and it's not even about that you disagree with them it's about they think you're not listening and so they'll ratchet up the level of conflict so it'll go from a disagreement over an item to uh, a disagreement about philosophy of ministry to i don't like you as a person to i don't want you to win to i want to take down da- i want to take you down as a leader to mm-hmm. i want to destroy this church right like that it just yeah. it gets worse and worse and worse because um, and it's not about agreement. It's about feeling unheard and unlistened. And it's about to destruction too, sometimes. Yeah. 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 Which is tough. So we'll, we'll come back to You'll see those themes here as we go through these seven things. But anyway, we, totally. we want to lead change. We have to lead change. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're as leaders, we're stewards of God's church, whether you're a pastor or an elder or some other ministry leader, you, you're going to have to influence change, positive change. And there, there's always going to be some type of resistance and there's always problems you can create for yourself. So, There are some things we can do to lead it well and uh, to help it go as smoothly as possible. It's that we don't rush through change. We don't avoid it. We don't kind of limp our way through it, but we, we handle it in a graceful, uh, godly way. So here are our seven things. Um, Ooh, look at that over your shoulder. Uh, This is, this is professional. This is looking good. Except if you're listening, if you're listening to the podcast, I have a, we have a video version of this podcast. And uh, I've got a screen behind me. So anyway, number one is to pray, right? That's the, that's the first key thing to do as you're leading yeah. change. And I would say specifically to pray for wisdom and courage. 
because when you're introducing change, um, you are you're just you're disrupting the norms of the church, and um, you need to do that with um, you need you need God's wisdom and discernment for that. Absolutely, and you also need courage too, because um, uh, what's good for a church? Oftentimes, healthy changes that a church needs that will lead to the church thriving and better engaging in God's mission will be resisted by people mm. in the church. And so, um, uh, it you really you really need courage to because uh, you you may be needing to make a change that is being resisted by long time uh, influential people in the church that that have a vested interest in keeping things the way they are, maintaining status quo. Um, and um, that's not always the case in every, every situation, but sometimes in unhealthy churches, uh, things, if things are in decline, um, there's a resistance to change because people get more risk averse. The more they need to change, the, 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 the more resistant they are to changing. Also, people subconsciously are protecting uh, their territory within the church, so leadership roles and ministries, and and so they don't want new things to start because it can make changes for their ministry. It can. Some people also they don't know it, but they are resistant to more people stepping into leadership roles because it they sense that it may di- dilute their own leadership influence in the church. So yeah. they'll use the constitution as a weapon. They weaponize the constitution. Oh, you can't. That ministry is not in the constitution. That role is not in the constitution. You can't do that. You can't do this. Um, they will prevent new things from starting. Um, and, and, and so uh, because we are sinners and so we, we want what we want and it clouds our judgment, even as you as a leader, sin mm-hmm. clouds your judgment. So yeah, one of wisdom, the things that, uh, one of the things that I share with people too, when it comes to ministry, I'm, I'm always encouraging people to bring someone else with you. When you do something, you should be training someone else to do something. And so yeah. when you talked about how sometimes uh, bringing more people, people kind of feel like it's diluted. One yeah. of the things that I point out to people is you should be encouraged to train other people as you go because... Um, if you are not replaceable, you can never be promoted. And I know that that sounds really strange, like in the kingdom of God, but in a way, like think about how you are trying to build up future generations. And if you can't be replaced, realize that eventually you are no longer going to be able to fulfill your role in the church, in the kingdom of God. Yeah, and so if absolutely. you're not promoting other people into it, it's, it's going to be difficult. So always yeah. try to bring. So I love that, your, that idea of prayer. Yeah. Cri- Christian leaders, your biggest influence is not in what you do. Your biggest impact is not in what you do, but who you equip and empower. And totally. as you give away influence and authority and response, you know, you keep responsibility as a key leader, but you give away authority, mm-hmm. decision-making power and leadership roles, your influence grows. We think it's going to take away, but it actually yeah. results in growth. So, yeah. yeah, that's great. So I love that right. first sense prayer, yeah. you know, praying for yourself, praying that God will give you the wisdom to do it, praying for your church to prepare you to lead in that way of change. So Ryan, why don't you give yeah. us number two? Number two, create a sense of urgency. Create a sense of urgency. So Mm -hmm. that's actually easy right now. Um, If you think about all the things that your church has changed in the coronavirus pandemic, so you went very quickly into, chances are most churches very quickly went from no online worship to online worship every week. And sometimes Mm -hmm. multiple options, like you can go to YouTube, you can go to Facebook Live, you can go to our website. They may have also gone from no online giving to online giving platforms, no online forms of ministry to small groups and youth group and all kinds of stuff happening online. And, the, and, and under normal circumstances, those changes would have taken uh, years uh, because we, there is always resistance to change and people don't want to change unless they have to, unless the pain of remaining status quo is worse than the pain of changing. And in the pandemic, um, there is a natural sense of urgency because you have to, we're not, you know, churches aren't, 
it's not wise for churches to meet. It, it, it put communities at risk, parishioners at risk. And then after that, we realized government regulations are coming into place and made it difficult. So there's a high sense of urgency. And, and we also, as we reopen, there's also a high, a naturally a high sense of urgency. And so in times of heightened urgency, people are more open to change. So you may not need to cast much of that very clearly, very clearly right now, but other times you do need to, you do need to make it clear. Like if you need to, um, if you need to do a building project, you need to explain to people why, why it's urgent that you build, or if you need to hire somebody or you're starting a new ministry. Uh, again, most people are comfortable with things the way they are and you have to, uh, you have to show them why it's not okay to stay comfortable. Why it's, there's actually a, while you feel like everything is okay, there's, there's trouble brewing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Really good. That, that's something great to really point out too. that sense of that sense of urgency. One of the ways that I describe it in our church um, is adaptability. You know, like yeah. the coronavirus has done yep. something really well in, yep. in our church. And I hope that it's proven that in other people's churches too. And it proves that like one, we are resilient Two, yep. the word of God. God is a constant, no matter what is going on. Yeah. And three, God's created us to be adaptable. We, yeah. we are able to do this, but like you said, man, change is hard. And I get that. And, yeah. and people would yeah. rather not change if they don't have to. And so the coronavirus, like as much as we want to say, oh, it was bad. And there was this, and there was that, like at some points, you can see that there are positives that God is drawing out of, of a negative Absolutely. situation, which is great. Absolutely. And that's really the adaptability that we see yeah. in churches to, to make those changes. I, I've been encouraged by that. My Sunday mornings and or my, my Sundays in general are great when I get done worshiping because then I can hop on and I can listen to another pastor preach a sermon or in the week, if I need a little bit of encouragement, I can go on another church's Facebook page and, and yeah. listen to yeah. one of my good friends messages at, at their church that they preached on Sunday. I mean, it's great to have those yeah. options. That's it's awesome. fantastic. Yeah. It sounds All like right, you're Ryan. teaching a, you're teaching a great theology of change which is important totally, to inter interweave that in our teaching, our preaching, our leadership, yeah. that we're, we're, we're promoting that and encouraging that. Great job. Yeah. And, and also not to be afraid of like, of sharing too, yeah. in terms of like, it's okay if you go and listen to another church's message within, you know, our denomination or, or go and support uh, this other individual, you know, I'm leading a Bible study with a group of friends who aren't, aren't even a part of the church of the Lutheran brethren, but they're all a part of different Lutheran churches. And it's great to kind of have that camaraderie so that people can see that we're, yeah. that we're working together during these times. So, so it's, awesome. it's a huge encouragement. All right, dude, bring us to number three. Yeah. So number two, create a sense of urgency. Number three, build a coalition for support. Mm -hmm. um, now, so let me, let me unpack this one a little bit. Um, when you're making a change, you need to, uh, you need to involve other people in that. You need to um, you need to build support from other people. Even if you're the you're technically whatever position you have, if you're a ministry leader, elder, pastor, and you technically have the authority to make a decision, it's still wise to get buy-in and support from other people that you've sought input from. And there's a few a few groups of people that you you want to have involved. So one is stakeholders. So that's that's anybody that the change is going to affect you. You want them, um, you know, to, to be able to speak into the situation and let them know what you're thinking about doing and, and get their support. Um, like, so like if you're going to make a change to your worship services right now from digital to on site, you need to make, you can't just to say, Oh, uh, we're going to start meeting on site now. And then, and no one, no one said anything to your worship leaders or your greeters or your ushers <laughs> or your custodians or your trustees or, you know, and you tell yeah. them afterwards the day before you're going to create a whole lot of problems for yourself. Mm -hmm. So, the, so stakeholders is important to get their, their input. You also have other groups of people. Uh, you have formal or positional leaders, and then you have uh, people who are, uh, have relational power or capital in your church they are opinion leaders. They are respected. They may not even hold a title, 
but everyone knows them and loves them and really takes to heart what they say. And they, they may have never even held uh, a major leadership role in the church, but uh, all the big decisions in the church tend to go along the way that person is thinking. So work to build some support and, and engage other people in the change process. Nice. Yeah. That, that building that coalition is great. One of the things I, I preached a sermon the other day and I talked about how um, community is so important in the kingdom yeah. of God. Yeah. Realizing that, that you have yeah. the support of other people, especially in this moment where people are um, really lonely. The yeah. pandemic has done a, a real number on people to make them feel lonely. And yeah. so realizing that they are part of a bigger group that they can find community with is important. So building that coalition yeah. is really good. What's number four? Yeah. yeah, number four is engage with the responses and fears of people. So when you go build that coalition, you're going to find people who aren't behind it, who don't agree with you. And that's okay. So our natural temptation is to be, is to avoid those people. And here's, and that's where the problems with conflict really come into play. We want to avoid them. And then they feel like you're leaving them out. You're not talking to them. You're not listening to them. And so they may escalate the conflict. They may get louder and noisier. They may resist what you're doing more and more because they haven't been heard or listened to. So if someone is confused or they've got questions, they're afraid, or they just outright oppose it, keep close to those people have conversations with them and uh and even if you don't get their buy-in and they don't become part of that coalition you should be saying to them in some way hey i i want to make sure that i understand what you're saying do i do you, and then repeat back what you've heard in your own words and say am i understanding you correctly is this is this your viewpoint and and even if we can't ultimately do what you're looking for i want to make sure that i understand what it is that you're valuing and is important to you. Um, yeah. You can yeah, also, great. yeah. And you can also ask those people too, like, Hey, will you try this with me? Especially if it's like a new ministry initiative, it's good to like say, we're, we're doing this. We're going to try this for a year and we're going to evaluate it and to say, Hey, would you be willing to try this with us for a year? Would you be willing to support this and mm. to, um, you know, allow this to, to happen uh, and, and evaluate it with us. Yeah, so. I love that idea. I think about that too. So Ryan, you as a parent, uh, I mean, we had foster kids. One of, uh -huh. one of the things they really harped on was pre-teaching. And I, and I always think of how pre-teaching relates to ministry in terms of like, don't try to teach while you're in conflict. Don't, don't try to uh, do things while people are in a sense of, well, this is change and, I, and I'm upset with yeah. change. Yeah. Go to them first before you start to enact stuff in a form of pre-teaching. And you, you'll be amazed how well that not only works with kids, but how well that works with people in general. Um, a lot of times people are just encouraged to know that you're coming to them because you value their opinion. So really yeah. engaging yeah. people um, is is so important in ministry, like you said, and it's really important to remind people yeah. that you don't have to agree, but that you're engaging with them because you care about them. Yeah. You do, you love them. Yeah. And so that's great. So, yeah. um, all right, now number five, this is one of my favorite ones. I love number yeah. five. Give yeah. it to me. And, and this kind of ties into what you were, you were just talking about before here. And that, that number five is over communicate. So, you know, as you're engaging with people, if they're, if they're not certain, about how they feel about this, or they know they don't like it, keep in connection with them and check in with them during the change. Like, how is this going? What are you seeing? What are the problems you're observing? You know, keep, keep checking in and hearing what they're concerned about as you're going along. And that's a part of over communicating. So you want, you need to communicate more than you think is necessary, uh, way more than you, than you think is necessary. So, and that's before you make any changes and during the changes and after. You need to over communicate. And when you're in planning, you need to over communicate with the stakeholders that are going to be affected by it. And then when you're rolling things out, you need to communicate that a change is coming, that you're working on a change. So like during the pandemic, one great thing I've seen is when churches have said, hey, we're, our elders are meeting and we're talking about 
uh, how we're going to do ministry for the next month. And we, we don't, you know, we haven't figured it out yet, but we're working on it. And that was all people needed to hear, you know, in that moment. Okay. Someone is doing something about it. We don't even know what the decision is, but they're working on it. That's yep. what they needed. And um, it makes people feel safe too. That's yeah, another absolutely. important thing. When, yep. when you, when you over communicate, yep. there is a sense of safety that you're taking uh, their life seriously yep. or, or their yep. safety seriously, which is really important for people, especially in a yep. church setting. And be, so, yeah. And one of the important things to communicate about beforehand is the, the loss or the, the potential challenges that may come uh, to again, because those who aren't supportive, they're going to think, Oh, you're going to, you're going to kind of minimize the, the, the loss that comes with this. If you think of uh, a father walking his daughter down the aisle at the wedding, it's a happy moment. It's good for the family. It's good for the father daughter relationship. It's, it's, it's a celebration for the whole community. It's a wonderful moment. And yet there's a sense of loss, right? For the father as even in this most joyous of moment. Um, so we need to acknowledge uh, if something is going to end or change, we need to acknowledge that. And, and as we communicate, that can disarm people who feel like you're not dealing with this the right way. Yeah. It's like, okay, Ryan, I'm glad, these problems. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you're working through that now with the, with the giving away of your daughter, considering that you have three of them. Oh, no, that, let's not talk about it. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, I was going to say, wow, like you're, like you're working through that already i mean you probably have 10 10 years maybe uh not, not even uh, i can't think anymore yeah I, i'm sorry uh, that, that probably oh, i'm gonna be a blubbery overwhelmed. mess i'll yeah. be a blubbery <laughs> sentimental mess that uh I'll, my whole family be frustrated with me like yeah it's yeah. totally all right I, so so that's over that's over communicate and and yep. i think that's also where prayer comes back in, man. Like over communication really takes a level of prayer for you to say, this is important. Yeah. Let me keep checking in with these yeah. individuals. So now what's yeah. number six, number six, celebrate. Okay. Yes. There's a number of different, a number of things you need to celebrate. So first of all, if something is ending, you need to celebrate that. Okay. So if you're going to, if starting something new means you've got to stop something else, there is a tremendous sense of loss that comes with that. And you need to celebrate the good that came from it. So uh, b back when I was a, p a pastor, we had, a, we had been running a, uh, a Saturday night worship service and we wound up closing it and adding a service to our Sunday morning schedule instead. And it was a really tough decision. There was a group of people that loved it. We just, we weren't able to sustain it at the time. And so we, we could, or we couldn't figure out a way to, to make it work, to continue it. So there's a tremendous amount of loss. Everybody, people, the people that were there loved it. Um, but we knew we couldn't keep doing it. So we, we, um, you might be tempted to feel like it's a failure and we just, it's, it's a, it's a, a point of shame, but we intentionally celebrated the service when we ended it. So we said, Hey, we want to, we want this service to go out with a bang. And we are going to just, if this is the last one, come and celebrate all the, the people that have become a part of our church as a result, the way it's changed our church body, the, just the blessings that it's been. Uh, so we, we celebrated something that was ending. So make sure you do that. If you're, you're making a changing to the a change, a changing, making our changing, if you're changing something in the building, you're taking down a, um, a beloved painting that was given as a memorial gift or something that you recognize it and celebrate it um, and that you help people grieve. We, we do that when a pastor leaves. We have a farewell celebration to help people grieve and express their sadness that something is ending and their thankfulness to God for what it's meant to them. So yeah. celebrate things that are ending, celebrate things that are beginning, celebrate early victories in, in a change process. So we, while you're changing something, it's, it's, it's very susceptible to sabotage um, mm. by people who want status quo restored. And they often don't know they're doing this, but uh, changes, th new things are very vulnerable to being shut down. And so when you know, early steps of progress should be acknowledged and celebrated. Um, you know, so if you're doing a building project, it might be the first uh, time the building committee meets, you know, 
you post a picture on social media, right? Like it's, that in itself is not a big deal, except you're celebrating, hey, here's a step. We're taking a first step mm. and we're going to, we're going to acknowledge that with joy and excitement. Nice. Uh, and also, so those early victories and, com- and the completion of the change process. So like when you have made all those changes to acknowledge them and to celebrate them, like this has been a massive project. It hasn't been easy for us. It's meant mm-hmm. loss. It's been a lot of new work. Uh, uh, we have new people in leadership though. We've, we've got, we're connecting with our community in a new way. Um, it's transformed the way we engage in God's mission, right? A- acknowledge those things and speak those things for the church body because it helps them to accept it. Um, nice. Yeah. yeah and that's again, great. you're safeguarding against sabotage. Like it, yeah. when something, when you've, been, when you've implemented a new change, uh, even when the change is done, it can still come under attack in those early weeks and months. And so that helps kind of work against that, that negative narrative that can crop up. So lots of parties, lots of celebration, lots of parties. Yep. I can't, I can't help but feel that that seven kind of goes along with six. It does. Absolutely. Project hope and excitement because people are scared as Mm. uh, change is scary. It's unknown. It's uncertain. And so if you're the one leading change, people are looking to you for boldness and confidence. They're going to get that from you. And once they're living in that change, they'll probably be able to embody that hope and excitement themselves. But they need you to express that and project it for the, for the whole church body. And that also helps um, deal with concerns about the change, awareness, anxiety, keeping the anxiety levels low in the church is really, really healthy and important. Uh, and that's your part of your job as a leader. So you need to cast vision. Like not everybody can see what it's going to be like when you get there, you have a vision for that. So communicate that and how excited you are and how hopeful you are for the future of the church, that the, the best days of the church are yet ahead. And, you know, here's why this is what it's going to mean as we do this. This is how, we're impacting our community in a new way, how new people are going to come to Christ or new disciples will be made, whatever it is, uh, be excited and, and make it worth all the pain and discomfort that, that comes with a change. Nice. Yeah. I thank you for your insight into that, Ryan. I know that that's going to be uh, impactful uh, for people too. And projecting hope and excitement. I mean, we're, we're at kind of a, an infancy right now with this podcast and and we're excited to see where God's going to take it. And we're going to just continually live out these seven things that you gave to us all dealing with change uh, so that we can awesome. project excitement. Yeah. So, you know, as, as more episodes come in, I hope that we can do that. So I want to, yeah. I want to thank you, Ryan, for sharing yeah. that. Yeah. With us. So, and, yeah. This is such yeah. a huge topic. There's so much more to say. We'll revisit this again. I know, we wound up with a super long episode, but we did the timing. I think it just, this is important stuff to work through right now because of the situation we're in. So yeah, our apologies for a mega long episode, but cool. there it is. Yeah. And I want to thank the listeners um, for yeah. listening to us. If you yeah. made it all the way to the end of this, <laughs> like throw yeah, right. us a comment yeah. or something, or let us know. Yeah, Don't forget yeah. to subscribe to the forge podcast uh, to receive notifications when the next episode drops i promise you that the next episodes won't be as long as this one we promise and uh, feel free to share this information with colleagues and friends and family so thanks for listening guys ryan thank you for sharing your input uh, and your knowledge with us and we'll see you next time all right bye-bye everybody